My name is Nancy Bui. Today is uh, March the 6th, 2011. I am going to interview Mrs. Uh, Jennifer Nguyen at Saigon Houston Radio Station of Bel Air, Houston, Texas. Uh, this is a part of the 500 Oral History Project of the Vietnamese American Heritage Foundation. Uh, hello, how you do? I'm well, thank you. You're welcome. Um, can you tell me what is your name and where were you born? Uh, my Vietnamese name is um, Lin Hương Đình Nguyễn. My American name is Jennifer Nguyễn, and I was born in 1965 in Nha Trang, Vietnam. Yeah, do you still remember a little bit about Nha Trang? Hmm. Uh, where were you born? I, I do. Um, yeah. I was born and raised in Nha Trang. Yes. Um, I remember my childhood, most of my childhood were very pleasant memories. Um, what I remember most was um, in 1975, at the time of the plight of the Vietnamese people from north mm -hmm. of Nha Trang, especially in the areas of Da Nang mm -hmm. and Hue, who basically flew, uh, or actually um, um, traveled to Nha Trang mm -hmm. um, and to refuse to suffer, yeah, yeah. and suffer from, from that plight. Uh, I, what I know in Nha Trang, I mean, uh, defeated before Saigon, okay. and uh, and then, uh, do you remember what would you and your family uh, did at the time? My father was a um, navy mm -hmm. um, soldier. My mother was a housewife. At that time, I was a student. Mm -hmm. um, what I remember during that time was a very chaotic time. Mm -hmm. And um, before Nha Trang fell, mm -hmm. Hue and Da Nang fell first. I and I remember all those refugees coming from Hue and Da Nang traveled to Nha Trang, most of them by boat. Mm -hmm. And uh, the stories I heard were horrendous, meaning that those people suffer so much, mostly uh, without food and water. And so a lot of um, uh, people, especially children, died. Uh, during that flight, and um, uh, the streets of Nha Trang were filled with people, dead people, um, and they lined the roads of Nha Trang, and that's what my memory of that war in 1975 was about. What was you feel at the time? You remember it still haunted you in some way? Oh, absolutely. I was very sad at the time, and mm -hmm. still very sad today, mm -hmm. because of all those people who died. Yeah. Do you have in your memory um, of 30 some years, do you still have any um, happy story about your hometown? <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Those were the happiest, I think, um, period of my life because I was very naive at that time, being a student, being very carefree, yes. living in a country, Nha Trang has beautiful beaches, yes. and my family was there. Um, we had a very close-knit family and had a very good life. Yeah. How was the hobby for a young girl uh, and then your friend about that time? What was your hobby? What you play? I spent a lot of time on the beach. <laughs> swimming and... Swimming, mm -hmm. collecting seashells. Uh -huh. um, lots of time on the beach because our house is so close to the beach. Wonderful. Uh, can you tell us, um, after Nha Trang fell, uh, what did your family do? I mean, how did you travel to the south? Um, our family um, traveled by jeep from Nha Trang into Saigon. Um, part of that road, I believe it was Highway 1, was mm -hmm. blocked by the communists. Mm -hmm. And so I think after we passed um, Phan Thiet, Phan Rang Phan Thiet, mm -hmm. Uh, we could not travel by road anymore because that road was completely blocked. Mm -hmm. So from Phan Rang Phan Thiep, we took boat. Mm -hmm. um, we was able to catch a boat and uh, went to Saigon. Mm -hmm. What's uh, with the scenery and uh, you know people uh, around you at that time? You know, I believe not you and your family not the only one. were not the only one. H how was the on the road and everybody? at that time? The road um, was um, filled with cars and people. Um, I believe the one jeep that we were on had something like 20 plus people okay. to include all the belongings that we could carry at that time. And it wasn't much. 
Um, the road, like I said, was filled with people and cars. We were maybe going at best five, ten miles per hour uh, for most of that stretch of road. Um, it was very chaotic. People were very desperate. Um, it was uh, just a very um, anybody died desperate. on the road. Or Plenty of die? people died on the road. Um, lots of people were wounded. Mm -hmm. uh, there were people going to Saigon. There were people going to Nha Trang. Mm -hmm. um, people just didn't know where to go, and so I think both ways were blocked. But mostly, most of those uh, cars were and jeeps were heading towards Saigon. You, you mentioned about people die on the road. Um, um, what caused the death? Is it bombing? Or bombing? Um, some of them, I believe, were war wounds, mm -hmm. um, gunshot wounds, mm -hmm. um, and some of them were just plain star starvation, meaning especially the children and the elderly people. So the, the people probably they walk from north to north or right. south. Mm -hmm. right. So, right. so what happened after that? Um, you travel from uh, on the road to Chang. You get you mm -hmm. where your family went from there. Um, from Phan uh, Phan Thang, Phan Thang, Then we, like I said, we took. We was able to, to catch a boat mm -hmm. into Saigon. Mm -hmm. And um, by the time we got to Saigon, all we had was the clothes on our back, mm -hmm. and we basically we lost all our belongings. And my mom, my dad were with me, and I have three younger brothers. The old, the youngest one. Uh, was two years of age, yeah. and so by that time we were also without water and without food for for many days. So who ha what happened to you in Saigon? I had an uncle mm -hmm. who I believe was um, a major at that time mm -hmm. in the um, Vietnamese army, mm -hmm. and uh, he came to rescue us from the beaches of uh, Saigon, mm -hmm. and he took us into his home. And. And how long you stayed there, and how did you get out of Vietnam? Um, once we got settled in Saigon, it wasn't very long before Saigon was bombed, mm -hmm. and the attack on Saigon um, occurred. Mm -hmm. So when the um, bomb started, um, my dad, being a Navy intelligence, um, talked to the family and said, we have to leave Vietnam. Mm -hmm and tried to convince my uncle to leave as well, but you know, his family was not going to go. And so our family went down to the beach and basically uh, found the closest boat to get on so that way we could um, escape Saigon. What day was this? Do you remember what, what day was it? I really don't remember what day this is, that was. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very close to the day Saigon fell. It was very close, yeah. It wasn't very long until mm -hmm. uh, Saigon fell. I see. Uh, uh, what kind of ranking your father had in the military? Um, I believe he's a, a regular soldier. Mm -hmm. um, he was not. He was non-commissioned, not an officer. I see. Mm -hmm. And then he said he's uh, with the um, uh, security uh, mission or. Right, he was a with the naval intelligence. Oh, intelligence I see. Most of the time, I never saw him in a uniform when I, I was a child. I see. And a part of his mission to go to Saigon was to bring some intelligence material uh, that his agency was collecting to deliver to Saigon. I see. And um, because of his um, position within the navy, um, we knew that he, you know his fate was not going to be uh, well mm -hmm. uh, if he was captured. Yes. Uh, do you have any um, um, memory with your dad, or he always busy with war? He uh, uh, time to spend with you? Or? No, I my memories of my father was very minimal, meaning that I only remember being with him um, when he came on home on vacations. There was a few times I visited him in Saigon when he was in the um, when his ship was docked. Um, uh, in Saigon, and um, but the very very few memories with my father. Mm. Do you feel that like you have some traditional that uh, passed on by fa your father or your mother that now you still carry on and with you and uh, mm -hmm. want to pass on to your children? Mm -hmm. My father is um, 
how should I say, is a great man in his own way. Um, he is um, a very just person. And uh, I think um, I learned a lot from my father because he always stood up for what is right. And that's something I've carried and something that I wish to pass on to my daughter as well. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, uh, from Saigon, your family got in the, uh, to, into the boat. Um, can you tell me about the trip after that? Where would you end up? Believe it or not, the night that we went on that boat ride um, was one of the most beautiful boat rides I've ever been on. <laughs> the reason why I said that was we actually escaped on a little boat, on a little motorboat, mm -hmm. maybe carrying 30, 40 people mm -hmm. into sea, into the ocean. And um, that night, if you have blocked out the fact that we were trying to escape the killing, mm -hmm. it would have been a beautiful night because the sky was lit up with fireworks, with bombs. And that night was a full moon. And I remember looking over the boat, the water was quite clear. You could see everything on the bottom uh, of the ocean. See the fishes sort of swimming by. So if I had just closed my eyes and not remember that I was trying to escape for dear life, it would have been a beautiful boat ride. The boat took us out into the ocean and um, basically I, we had to transfer boats several times because it was a small motorboat and in the middle of the ocean during the storm we had to transfer to another PT ship, mm -hmm. so a little bigger boat uh, that took us out into the Pacific Ocean to then meet up with another ship. I remember I believe that ship carried the designation of O3. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember my father having a discussion with my mother of what to do if this PT boat could not um, carry us out into the Pacific Ocean to meet with, uh, we'd meet up with another bigger boat or bigger ship. Yes. And I remember my father saying that we're going to die as a family. Um, for a 10-year-old child, that was very difficult, mm. yeah? Mm. So, um, of course, you meet up with a big boat, right? Mm -hmm. Let's see what happened after that. Right. Uh, I remember going out to the Pacific Ocean, meeting with the big ship, and the big ship was so overloaded with people that they would not allow us to board the ship. It was over capacity already. And we spent, I believe, two or three days hovering around this big ship, this big naval ship, and not being allowed to board the ship. And we knew that our fate was over, meaning that if these people were not going to allow us to board the big ship, uh, we had no uh, option except to return back to Saigon and then to face the fate. Uh, once we uh, land, um, you know, in Saigon. Um, there were many days that I stared out in the ocean thinking that that was it, that we were all going to die. And somehow, I think one of the sympathetic soldiers on this big navy ship threw down a rope ladder. And uh, with this rope ladder, my father carried my mother and the four children into the big ship. How was the scene on the big ship at that time? Was doing when mm -hmm. you got up there? It was um, calm chaos, if I can describe that. Meaning that the people who made it to the big ship knew that they had a chance, but it was chaotic because nobody knew what to do. Um, we didn't know what to do. The mental exhaustion was so great that once we boarded the big ship, uh, I, everybody fell 
into a deep sleep for a day without knowing that they were there. And there were so many people there that really there was no place to um, to position anybody. Every inch of space was being occupied. Uh, my father managed to find um, a little space on top of the deck. Mm -hmm. And you know, the Navy ships on top of the deck, they're railings, but they're not very secure. Mm -hmm. You can easily fall off uh, to the side of the, of the ship. Mm -hmm. And so what he did was he took some ropes and he, he tied. He basically um, made um, uh, a curtain, per se, and so that way the kids don't fall off of the ship. And uh, you know how many days after that, uh, by that big ship traveled to where? It traveled to um, the Philippines. Mm. Um, it was during the time of the travel to the Philippines that we heard that Saigon fell. Um, by the time the sh big ship docked in the Philippines, um, the ship pretty much the engine burned up. Um, so from the Philippines, um, we went. Um, the U.S. Navy took us on a on a cargo ship to, um, I believe, Wake Island. Wake. Wake Island. From there, we stayed. I don't know how long, uh, maybe a month or two. And from Wake Island, we went to Guam. And we stayed for there for a little while to get um, papers processed. In fact. I have a social security number that uh, belongs to the to Guam, the five eight six social security number. I see, wonderful. Uh, you did mention about during the you know the ship um, bringing you to Philippine people heard on the radio that Saigon fell. Do you, you remember what would you feel and or your family, especially your father, at the time? Everybody was very sad. Mm, there was mm, no word. No one spoke. All right. Um, so um, when you talk, mentioned the wood island, and uh, you stayed there about months, you have any memory on that uh, little island? Uh, Spent a lot of days on the beach again. There was really nothing to do in Wake Island. I see. Right. So lots of idle time. Lots of people. You know. How the food, uh, who, who give you the food, uh, the food to eat? Uh, I mean, how they feeding you or how, how people uh, got something to eat? We, um, I think food was provided for, for the most part. Um, um, I think they set up mess for us, so every family was portioned out uh, some amount of food that was already cooked. Mm -hmm. And for those people who were brave enough, they dived down into the ocean and collect some um, shellfish. Mm -hmm. And they cooked that to uh, to eat as well. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and then uh, you uh, transport to Guam. How long you stay in Guam? I can't remember. Mm -hmm. I would say about a few months. Few months. I see. Right. And uh, life at Guam mm, in that those few months um, have any memory? I don't remember much of Guam. Um, pretty much, I just like I said, most of they set up tents for us. Um, on the beach of Guam, and so we spent a lot of time on the beach. We spent a lot of time just not doing anything. Mm -hmm. um, the kids play. The adults, um, not sure what they did, mm -hmm. but um, we played a lot. I see. So from mm -hmm. Guam, and then where would you end up in U.S.? We were uh, from Guam. We our family went to Fort Chaffee, um, which is uh, military which was a military base actually in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Um, from Arkansas, we um, got sponsored out to uh, a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and from, so from Fort Chaffee, we went to Cameron, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. um, Oklahoma is your first uh, place in the U.S.? You Correct. stayed there for lo how long? You stayed we there? stayed there for a few years. Um, the person who sponsored us, like I said, um, was a teacher. So her name was Miss um, Eunice Graver. And um, 
At that time, she was probably in her 50s or 60s. Mm -hmm. She lived alone. She had a, a farm mm -hmm. uh, with cattle. And um, she had no family around. So mm -hmm. essentially, she took us um, to Cameron, Oklahoma, provided us assistance. Um, we did not realize how small the town Cameron, Oklahoma was. It was a very small town, very um, um, sparse community, meaning that you, you have to walk many, many miles before you encounter another house. Um, so we really did not have any other um, close connection with any other Vietnamese people at all. My father worked on the farm. Mm -hmm. um, the housing situation was not great. Ms. Graber had a trailer where she used to raise dogs mm -hmm. and she converted that trailer for us to use. Mm -hmm. Needless to say, um, we had to do a lot of cleaning up mm -hmm. and uh, to make it livable. Mm -hmm. still keep no in touch with Graver, the Cravers? Um, Ms. Graver? No. Mm -hmm. we, um, the relationship, uh, even though we're very grateful to have her sponsored us, mm -hmm. the relationship um, um, was not cordial, meaning that um, she basically um, misused my mom and dad. Um, she used them for labor to help her with um, the ranch. Um, she sort of hid us away. Um, during the few years that we stayed there, um, my mother miscarried. She really never took care of our family per se. Um, it was the Baptist church mm -hmm. that actually found out that my mother miscarried. and took her to the hospital. Yes. Yeah. What would you do at that time, in that form, far away from maybe, uh, I'm nowhere, far away from everything? You went to school at that time? No. I was in school. I went to school. It was on um, weekends. We went to church. Um, there was really nothing else to do. The four children played with each other, uh, helped with the work on the farm. Uh, Mom and Dad on weekends and evenings um, worked to help Ms. Graver. Mm -hmm. uh, she did fun work for Dad, mm -hmm. and um, Dad had to um, Dad travel to to work to make money. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember they didn't have uh, any ways to go to work, meaning we had no car, transportation. no transportation. So um, she got some neighbors to give my dad a ride to work and back, and that's how he made money, and when he came home, he worked for Miss Graver. And uh, he got paid from working on a Graver car? No. No? No. no. Wow. Um, and uh, you remember first day in school, what did it look like, how you uh, learned English? At uh, 10 years old, is you, what, what grade were you in and how you, I mean, adjust or that? I spoke no English when I came to the States mm -hmm. at all. And um, in Vietnam, I was in fourth grade. My mother decided that um, I needed to learn English, and so I repeated fourth grade when I, when I came to the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, my days uh, in school, basically I looked forward to math classes because I was very good in math. That's all I knew how to do. As far as trying to learn English, I was put in remedial education, meaning for the, I was put into classes where kids did not excel, who could not read or who had um, um, learning disabilities, um, to learn English. There was no such thing as English as second language at that time. Mm -hmm. And so I learned my ABCs and I learned to pronou pronounce, I learned to read uh, in those classes. So they teach you like a disabled, very much uh, disabled student uh, who cannot, uh, I mean, 
normally um, go to school and learn things like normal job. Correct. My English education was basically, um, like I said, I learned English with uh, learning disabled students. Mm -hmm. wow. Um, how the student, I mean your friends, classmate treat you at that time? Uh, very distant, mm -hmm. very distant. That community, like I said, um, was a farming community. I don't believe they've ever seen an Asian or a non-Caucasian in that community. So they all white. Um, mostly, yes. I don't remember seeing anything but non-Caucasians in. It, except for Caucasians in that uh, community. You have many problems. Somebody like, um, I mean, humiliate you or in any way that you feel like you've been discriminated at the time, Be beside the distance you feel. Absolutely. The people at that time were very angry still with the Vietnam War. They did not favor the Vietnam War. And even though it's a small farming community, most of the people still uh, was not very friendly towards the Vietnamese people. And so for to have a single family, a Vietnamese family, being sponsored into the community, some of them didn't really know uh, how to receive us. Um, every morning, my dad would uh, wait on the road to catch a ride to work. And the kids would be on the road catching the bus to school. And I remember many, many times dad came home very upset because the kids on the bus would be spitting at him um, or spitting at us. Um, but there was nothing that we could do at that time. There was no one to turn to. I see. So how you uh, deal with that and how your family deal with, with that? I mean, you talk, how, how you, um, I mean, you scope with you know, all those things. Um, we had each other. That's all we had. Um, we were fortunate enough to have other very kind people uh, within the community. The Ferguson family, um, I remember, who were also, Miss Catherine Burr Ferguson was also a teacher, who really took um, compassion in our family and um, saw the situation and helped us out. So they were the only other people who we could turn to in that particular family. Like I said, the kindness that they extended to us was what brought us out of that situation. Yes. Brought us away from Cameron, Oklahoma and away from Miss Grable. Yes. Before we go to the next thing, I would like for you to be specific. Like you said your mom and your dad work on farm, what they do, they raising cow or they do anything and or uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. mm -hmm. Like I said, um, I felt mm -hmm. at, at that time that my mom and dad were used mm -hmm. for um, labor. Mm -hmm. And mom and dad, because they do have cows, they raise cows and raise dogs, mm -hmm. and basically they raise dogs to, to sell. Mm -hmm. Um, they were my mom and dad were used like handyman, handy people, and um, mom and dad were very frail people, very tiny, very small. Uh, mom didn't weigh but maybe a hundred pounds at that time, and she had to lift heavy bales of hay to feed the cows. And during that, you know, during that heavy labor, she she miscarried. Uh, Miss Graber paid no attention to my mom and pay no attention to my family. Um, when my mom had a miscarriage, um, she became very sick. She, she became septic. And Miss Graber did not know. I went to Miss Ferguson and basically pleaded with her saying that my mom was sick. But we had no money to go to the hospital. Miss Ferguson contacted the, um, the Baptist Church basically took my mom to the hospital. Miss Graber did not take my mom. Miss Ferguson and the Baptist Church took my mom to the hospital and basically paid for all her medical care. Uh, do your family know that there, there was and are now a lot of government 
program that can help your family because they can be a refugee and they can apply for with them, I mean Medicaid, maybe, you know, uh, nobody tap your family in the, those, I mean, source, resources. Miss Gable? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Like I said, um, it was a farmer community with very sparse mm -hmm. families, you know. Um, we had no communication with anybody else. Uh, I want to ask that the, your father speak English at the time, so he can communicate any or? No. No? Yeah. And that was the other problem. Yeah. None, of, none of us spoke English yeah, at see. the time of, that we came here. So working on a farm without paying, is she charged for that? Uh, I mean, um, mobile home, you, you to you for the office, she, mm -hmm. she charge your money or charge your family money or you don't know? I, mean. I, I don't think she charges money. Uh, I see. Yeah. But the work, that you, uh, your father, parent work and mm -hmm. visiting that pay for her. Correct. <laughs> I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, in that small town, um, you have any good memory about about that small town? Yeah. The only good memory I had was the time I spent with Miss Ferguson and her family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, uh, how old were you when you leave that uh, town, and how you connect with the outside people? Basically, uh, Miss Ferguson helped us escape. Miss Grape, meaning that in the middle of night she took her whole entire family and took us to Fort Smith, Arkansas mm -hmm. and settled us in Fort Smith, Arkansas without Miss Gables knowing at all. Wow. Mm -hmm. mm, after that you have no, I mean, contact or heard any news about Graven anymore? No. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What? what? Could you want to say something? Yes. So we did not have contact with Miss Gable until mm -hmm. much, much later, many, many years later. Mm -hmm. She, through a friend, she found us. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, she tried to um, talk to my mom and dad to come back to Cameron, Oklahoma. She wanted to give us a parcel of land mm -hmm. so that way she can, so we can go return to Cameron, Oklahoma and, and work for her. And at that time, um, my mom and dad refused. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, after that your parents find a job and you go into the new school or how's that going? Right, so mm -hmm. my mom and dad was able to find uh, jobs in a manufacturing plant in Fort Smith, Arkansas. And I believe at that time they were paid something like two dollars and mm -hmm. fifteen, two fifty, something like that an hour. Mm -hmm. And then we, you know, she, they managed to save enough money to, um, to, um, to feed the family, to buy a car, um, a very old, old car. And the kids um, went to school, Castell went to school. So you are, um, after that, uh, you uh, finished high school in uh, Oklahoma, uh, I mean uh, Arkansas? Mm -hmm. No, we, are, we stayed um, in Fort Smith, Arkansas to 1980. Mm -hmm. um, my family lived in Fort Smith, Arkansas until 1980. Um, and the reason why we moved was because of the job market. I see. Um, from 1980 to present, um, we've been living in Texas all that time. Um, when my father, my father was looking for better job opportunities. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's the reason why we moved. So from Arkansas, we moved to Texas in 1980, mm -hmm. and we lived in Orange, Texas. Mm -hmm. Wow. Both parents worked as welders. Even my mom retrained and um, um, worked as a welder to weld big ships uh, in Orange, Texas. Um, Orange, if you don't know, is a small, also a small community. Uh, but more Vietnamese people. Mm -hmm. um, so we were a bit more active within the Vietnamese community. Uh, we stayed in Orange for a couple of years. After that, we, my parents bought a, a plot of land and um, we, um, we moved to Bridge City, Texas. So the kids then went to Bridge City um, and I graduated from Bridge City High School. 
remember when you and your family moved into the house at your your first home in U.S. What was your feeling? My first home in the U.S. You mean yeah, your father bought the, a new the home. first new home that he bought, right? Mm -hmm. It was a great feeling. Mm -hmm. We actually actually it was a little double wide trailer mm -hmm. that we put on the acre of land that they bought, and um, it was nice. It was it was nice being our own home, even though it was a double wide trailer, uh, not much to you know to speak of. But it was ours. So the four kids um, had a lot of fun um, going to school in Bridge City. Again, Bridge City was not very diverse. There was only a handful of Vietnamese families in that area, maybe four or five families mm -hmm. in that area. Bridge City is mostly Caucasian as well. Mm -hmm. um, very close to wider Texas. Mm -hmm. Is it north or south of Houston? It is uh, east, east of Houston. southeast oh. of Houston. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, f the people in Bridge City um, accepted us mm -hmm. because we were very peaceful people. Mm -hmm. We didn't create the problems. Mm -hmm. The children, the kids who attended school there, um, pretty much excel. Mm -hmm. We were non-troublesome kids. Mm -hmm. And so I think the community accepted us a bit better. Mm -hmm. um, so I graduated um, with honors from Bridge City High School, wow. managed to um, secure a scholarship, mm -hmm. the Amer American Business Women's uh, Association scholarship. And between work and the scholarship and some additional scholarships that I got from the university, um, I was able to go to Lamar University and graduated from Lamar with um, a bachelor's in science in biology. Wow. Um, in uh, college, do you feel any discrimination at all, or it was better at that time? I mean, the, during your time you were in college. Discrimination occurred from the moment I landed in the U.S. And the degree of discrimination changed as the years passed by. But yes, I experienced discrimination from the first moment I landed in the U.S., um, even until now. Can you be specific, um, some example about that you still remember happened to you? As far as college goes, um, I even though I feel and I experience discrimination, mm -hmm. um, I don't pay much attention to it. Meaning that I've always felt that we as a person have to overcome the difficulties that we face. Mm -hmm. There were many a times that my parents' car would be slashed, the, the tires would be slashed, mm -hmm. the battery cables would be cut because they were trying to compete with certain jobs with other people. Um, my experience with discrimination in school was when I wanted to go into pre-medical. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why I wanted to major in biology because I wanted to go to medical school. Mm -hmm. And at the time of the pre-medical interview, I was asked a very specific question, meaning that you are a woman, mm -hmm. this is your GPA, what makes you think that people are going to accept you in medical school? So I think we all face a certain degree of discrimination. Mm -hmm. How we perceive it mm -hmm. and how we manage that mm -hmm. is up to us. How you successfully overcome that? I mean, the dis discrimination. I tried. Every, I try much harder every time people tell me that I can't do it, mm -hmm. or because of this and that. I'm not able to excel. Mm. So more people 
undermine you and make you feel like you cannot do things like they do? Correct. I see. So uh, you when you graduated from uh, uh, for biology, uh, did you uh, continue with medical field? Or how's it going? I did. Mm -hmm. um, after I graduated at Lamar University in mm -hmm. Belmont, um, I applied for medical school mm -hmm. and was accepted into uh, the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. At that time, my family was very poor still. Um, Mom and Dad during that period really didn't have a job. The job market for welders dried up. Everything was shipped overseas. And so I applied for a scholarship with the military and got a health professional scholarship from the U.S. Army. And that's how I made it through medical school. And that's how you pay for medical school and then you, I mean, become a doctor? Right. Uh, you served in the military at all? I did. Mm -hmm. After I um, graduated from um, medical school um, in San Antonio, I entered the U.S. military mm -hmm. uh, for my training. Mm -hmm. um, I finished one year of internship at uh, Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas. Mm -hmm. And the specialty that I wanted to go into was so competitive at that time mm -hmm. that none of the um, interns were allowed to um, be accepted into that um, uh, residency program. So as a result, I ended up being, uh, being sent to Korea to serve in, as a general medical officer in Korea for one year. Mm -hmm. uh, after that year, I returned to Brook Army to do a three-year uh, anesthesiology residency, mm -hmm. completed my residency at Brook Army Medical Center, and after graduation, I went to um, serve as an anesthesiologist at um, Darnell Army Medical Hospital in Killeen, Texas. So in uh, medical school, you feel any uh, pressure, any discrimination from anywhere? I didn't feel discrimination mm -hmm. in medical school. Mm -hmm. Definitely the pressure to, um, to do well was there. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe that um, I prob yeah, that's probably the least amount of discrimination that I faced uh, since I came to the U.S. was during medical school. I see. How about in military? You, woman, you are a woman, you're a minority. You feel that in the military? Um, if there was discrimination, I didn't pay attention to it. Yeah. But it is it won't bother you in any way or it's just minor thing you don't feel? It I probably was at the mental state at that time that I have accomplished a lot mm -hmm. and I just didn't let it bother me. I'm pretty sure it was there and it was there. Mm -hmm. It's just not enough to make an impression uh, for me to remember. Any um memory of when you were stationed in Korea? Uh, can you tell us? It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, being away from the family. Mm -hmm. uh, Korea was still unstable at that time. Um, but the difficult part is, is being away from the family. Um, Korea is where I learned how to be a soldier. I was a physician, mm -hmm. but um, physicians and soldiers is very different. Mm -hmm. um, Korea is where I learned to be a soldier. Well, how how you was training to be a soldier? I mean, you completely be trained to walk, to crawl, everything. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? We I did my basic training at Camp Bullis in um, in Texas, and so during the basic training, we were taught how to shoot a nine millimeter, a forty five, a um, nine mil. Uh, I'm sorry, the um, yeah, all the weapons that the military had. We learned land navigation. Mm -hmm. We learned how to crawl in the middle of the night, find our ways with the compass. Mm -hmm. So we we had basic training to prepare us uh, for some of the soldiering skills. Um, in Korea, you know, I pretty much did all the training that the the soldiers did. I mean, I did the field deployments. Um, if they trained with a rucksack to 
to do their walk. I took put my rucksack on and I did my five mile walk with them. Mm -hmm. So uh, you were trained with male, I mean soldier? Uh, Mostly men, yes. Men, men. Uh -huh. Very few very few women mm -hmm. and especially very few women officers. I see. And I I guess very few Asian uh, I mean Asian officer, Asian soldier woman Asian woman in the in the training camp or in um do you have any any woman Asian woman in, in that? No. 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 Yes. Yeah. yes. Um you uh, are you married? Um, divorced now. Divorced yeah. now. Mm -hmm. When were you married? What year and um, how your life very busy with this Korean and stuff, so how do you have time to buy time to marry and have any children? I was married during my second year of medical school mm. and have um, my daughter during fourth year of medical school. Mm. So I have a 18-year-old uh, daughter now who mm. is currently going to um, Houston Baptist University. Mm. How you balance that? I mean, medical school is a killer here in this <laughs> country. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is it's difficult. Yes. But this is something I have always wanted to do. I think the reason why I wanted to go to medical school was the impact of the Vietnam War on me uh, when I was a child. Mm -hmm. So um, I have to say that it was very difficult to see people dying on the road mm -hmm. and not being able to help them and not having the skill set to help them. And so I think that's what really drove me to go into medicine. Mm -hmm. So the design, the, mm -hmm. the thing you want to be, that, that driven you to overcome all the obstacles and all difficulty? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so now, uh, what are you practice in? I mean, uh, you're, uh, you're a doctor, what, what practice you are in right now? You I'm an anesthesiologist. Mm -hmm. I, um, after I left the military, actually, when I was in the military, I s did another deployment. I, w I went to spend um, nine months in Bosnia mm -hmm. um, on, on the deployment for the, a peace mission, mm -hmm. the S-47 peace mission mm -hmm. in Bosnia. So I returned from Bosnia a year after I left the military. This was back in 2001. In, from 2001, until 2008, I worked for Beto College of Medicine. Mm -hmm. I was an, uh, an assistant professor of anesthesiology, mm -hmm. and I worked at Bentop and uh, Methodist Hospital. Mm -hmm. um, in 2008, I left um, Bentop Hospital and left Baylor to join um, the Michael E. D. Bakey Veterans Affairs Hospital mm -hmm. uh, in Houston, Texas. And I'm currently the director of the pre-op clinic at that hospital. Um, what do you think about Vietnam War? I think it was a very tragic war. Altogether very tragic. Too many people died. Too many people suffered. And our people are still suffering. If you need to tell your your daughter, mm -hmm. your granddaughter and grandson about that war, what would you tell them? I tell them to learn from the mistakes from the war. Um, um, we learn from our history, and we learn from our mistakes. And mistakes are going to repeat itself if we don't learn from it. And everybody deserves freedom. Everybody deserves the pursuit of liberty, of being able to, to pursue happiness. And I don't believe the Vietnamese people have that opportunity at this time. Well, uh, when you are uh, raising a, ch a child in your family, you feel like it's uh, important to keep um, tradition, culture of your own? Absolutely. Um, 
I value my Vietnamese culture. I value the family unit. I value the closeness of the family unit. Um, within our own family, we're fortunate enough to preserve that. And I believe a large part of that has to do with, the, with my parents. Mm. My parents have sacrificed so much for the children. Um, even with, in the worst of times, they were able to hold the family together. We overcame a lot of struggles. And it wasn't for the strength of my mom and dad, um, this family would have fallen apart. I had a mother who was very understanding, meaning that when they were struggling, when they had no jobs, no ways to make money, um, how they made money was to raise cattle, raise dogs, yeah, to make whatever money that they could make or to plant herbs to sell to the grocery store, to do whatever they can to earn money and not be dependent on society. So that way they can nurture the family. Um, the children still remembers that. The children still remembers the hardship. I graduated from medical school, became successful. All the Four kids actually are very successful and very productive members of society. My brother who's next to me is an engineer. The one next to him is also a doctor. Wow. And the youngest one is a pharmacist. So we're, if it wasn't for them and for their sacrifices, I don't think we would be the people who are, we are now today. I remember the one conversation during the times of hardship that I had with my mother. Um, I had a decision to make. Do I want to finish a two-year degree and become a microbiologist? Or do I want to finish a four-year degree and um, try to go to medical school? If I finish the two-year degree, I can go out and work and help out with the family. And I remember my mother, even in, in the desperate of times, said to me, you go and do what you want to do. Wonderful. Well, your children now, your child now, of course, uh, didn't have to go through like what you've been through. Correct. Um, how do you think that you can pass on that spirit so that it will drive them to do well in life and, uh, I mean, have others like you do? She sees the closeness of our family. She sees the family structure that is so highly valued within the Vietnamese culture. Mm -hmm. And she sees everybody coming to each other's aid and to be there for each other. And she learns from that. Because my parents have sacrificed so much to raise a family, they really have no savings of their own. So right now, they're living with me, and I'm the caretaker. My daughter sees that. Mm -hmm. And so that's a tradition that she is going to inherit from our culture. Um, it is very difficult to, for children who've never experienced what we went through um, to understand um, of all the difficulties. But we tell our stories to our children. And our children, believe it or not, are interested in hearing them. My daughter is very interested in how I overcome these difficulties because, believe it or not, she also encounters these difficulties, um, even in her current society. Being Vietnamese, female, she's experiencing it in school. Um, and I, it would not surprise me if she's going to experience it in the workforce as well. Um, in your family, do you speak Vietnamese at all? I do with my parents. Um, my daughter um, speaks mostly English to, to me. 
um, when she speaks with her grandparents, she tr does try to speak in some Vietnamese. But she understands a lot more than she can speak. Mm -hmm. Over here, how your family gathering is that for like, are you Buddhist or you? I am. Yeah, so you, uh, h how you celebrate a traditional, I mean, the event or, I mean, uh, religion? I used to be very, very active within the, um, the temple mm -hmm. and within the community because of my job at the moment. Uh, I really have not had time to participate in those events. But events like that, uh, which is Vietnamese New Year, I, I, we have traditions of giving gift, gift um, bags to, to the kids. Mm -hmm. So we do pass that tradition on. Um, well, you live a very marvelous life, uh, meaning, you know, you put a lot of effort to make your life right, even you didn't have a good start. Uh, what could you um, tell the younger generation about what should they do to have the, to follow your step? Accomplishments are not something to be taken or given. You have to achieve it yourself. You have to overcome it yourself. People will face difficulties in life. Our children will continue to face difficulties in life. And what we have to do is to teach them, try to overcome it. And for the people who came here, first generation, how they achieve success is they overcame it. And that require a lot of effort and hard work. Um, we can't expect to sit here and wait for things to change. If you want change, you have to make it happen. You have to be an active participant to make that happen. Um, a few more questions regarding to the community. Um, you hear in Houston, and you see community very active, and some good and not good way. Mm -hmm. What, how you feel about those? I am very proud of all the accomplishments that the Vietnamese Americans have achieved since 1975. Um, I looked around, and I'm I'm a physician. I looked around when I grew up. There was no physicians within the community at all. Now, you see MDs, physicians all over Houston. Um, you see very successful people. And we're starting to see a community that is starting to give back. And that was a culture that we didn't have before. I think we're a much more generous society, um, um, community. community at the moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that is a, a good start for our community, mm -hmm. is to be able to achieve gain success and give back and help somebody else. Um, as far as the other things in life, um, I see youth who are getting into drugs, getting into trouble, and I'm very sad. Um, and that's something that we as community have to try, maybe a little bit harder, to find ways for our, our youth to to, to, to overcome that situation, um, because it is a very sad situation. Well, what you, uh, in your, I mean, in your view, what would you think the Vietnamese American community would be in the next 10, 20 years from now? I hope the Vietnamese community will continue to grow, and I hope that that spirit of giving back will continue to grow. It isn't just about us being here and being successful. It is about building a community and helping others who are still left behind. Uh, you're talking about people left behind. Um, in your mind, um, have you have a lot of thinking about Vietnam? Oh, I do. Mm -hmm. so what do you think about Vietnam now? Uh, the last time I visited Vietnam was when I visited my grandmother in 
six. And at that time, I was in the military. Actually, I was, um, I want to say, yeah, I was a major in the military. I was in Korea at that time. And uh, I took a flight to visit my grandmother, who was very elderly. She was 80-something years old at that point. And my grandmother and I were very close in Vietnam. So I was very hesitant to visit the country because it was still a Vietnamese communist country. And I was an American soldier. High-ranking high officer. And a high-ranking officer. I didn't know what they were going to do to me. And um, I did travel with a military ID at that point. But I was afraid to be found out and was afraid to be detained. Um, the country, even though there was more, no more shelling, no more bombing, no more shooting, you can still see the remnants of war in 1996. Um, the country was not well built. The roads were not well built. The people were still poor. And they just didn't have the freedom to move, didn't have the freedom to speak. It was a very brief trip. Um, that trip was to see my grandmother. Um, but I still see the remnants of war. So after that trip, have you make another trip to? I have Vietnam? not. Uh -huh. I have not. I'm hoping that the next trip that I make, I will take my daughter with me, so that way she can also see the country and see where Vietnam is on the map. Yes. Well, uh, I I forgot to ask you. Uh, are you still in service, or you the uh, retired from service? I mean, I, I I I was honorably discharged. I left the service in 2001. So after eight years of service within the military, I I left. What was your ranking at that time? At the time you got did chore? Did you chore? A major. A major. Right. Wonderful. That's a beautiful young uh, major. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, well, you see a lot of um, things happening in the war right now. Young people stood up, standing up for you know freedom and de democracy. You think that uh, it's gonna happen to Vietnam? I think it will. But it will be very slow. I think it will happen, but it will be very slow. And it will only happen with the backings of the democratic nations um, in the world. It's not going to happen without their backing. Um, you see, the American, uh, we are uh, involved with a lot of different countries, um, you know, regarding to security, military, and stuff. Um, what do you think about? Um, you know, American policy toward uh, Vietnam War. Uh, you have any thinking about that at all? Currently or in the past? In the past and currently. Um, in the past, um, the I right now work um, at the vet, uh, vet, at the Veterans Hospital. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my patients do talk to me about Vietnam War and their experience. And I don't think either side have good stories to say about that war. Neither do our soldiers, the Vietnamese soldiers, or the American soldiers. I think both sides suffered. It is regrettable that it came to that point, to where Vietnam was overtaken by communism. But on the same token, I do understand why the Americans had to give up that war. Um, at this point, what we need to do is look forward and look forward to how do we develop a democratic society where people can live freely and live with some kind of expression. Right now, people cannot freely express themselves uh, because, of, because of the communist regime. And people are suppressed because of the communist regime. And I believe, like I said, democracy is going to happen at some point. But the people have to want it enough. And the world have to want it enough to make that happen. 
Well, um, do you have any experience or feeling or thought that uh, you want to share and I didn't ask you yet? Like I said, the, the spirit of giving back to the community, we, we do need to, um, to promote that. And um, we shouldn't forget the people who are left behind. Uh, and with the young generation, what you, uh, I mean, you want to tell them about how can they, uh, you know, improve and then uh, do something for Vietnam? One of my dreams has always been to set up a library so that our young people will have an opportunity to go in and read mm -hmm. and learn and explore. I believe that you give them the access to knowledge, people who want to learn will search it and seek it out. We have to give people opportunity and let them take and let them have access to opportunity. Um, but as a society and as a community, I hope that's something that we can continue. There are many things that I think the community can do. Um, for instance, things like, if you take a look at the Jewish community, they're very successful. They're very successful, beautiful community outside of oppression. We may want to study their community a bit and learn how we can help people get out of oppression, escape from oppression. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for all the things you have shared and uh, also um, your compassion of uh, one someday that um, Vietnam will be, you know, free, and also the young people will learn from you mm -hmm. to do good for their life. Um, on behalf of the Vietnamese American Heritage Foundation, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Yeah. Cảm ơn chị quá. Dễ thương quá. Mà đi qua cái câu chuyện của mình chị rất là interesting tại vì Um, từ trước giờ đó là tụi mình um, phỏng vấn đó, cái vấn đề discrimination ít người dám nói ít yeah. người nói đó là cái câu chuyện của gia đình rất là compelling. Yeah. 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 Yeah.